cats or dogs and why uh, don't ask me why but and who choose carefully that was the exact wording of the question and who cats or dogs and why and who choose carefully a particular <laughs> a particular dog or cat oh okay i, I understand <laughs> it as much as you do to be honest yeah um i, I don't know um i always thought i was a dog person uh but to be honest I haven't had that many close connections with dogs. So, um, I, whereas I used to have cats uh, when I lived with my parents. Well, we didn't like ever choose to have cats. Cats just seem to move into our house. I think there's a lot of people like that. that out there, like, you know, just like a neighbor's cat. It's just like, nah, my parents have uh, adopted a dog and now I don't want to live there anymore. <laughs> so they find somewhere else to go. And yeah, that usually ends up being my parents' house. They end up uh, taking in all the unwanted cats. Um, so I guess, I am a cat person now. Um, didn't think I was, but um, yeah, no, I, I love cats. And I would pick uh, my cat, Alonzo, who was uh, really cool, named after one of the cats from the musical Cats. <laughs> nice. I, uh, I, I kind of, I don't know where I sit. I'm a bit on the fence, cats or dogs. I like yeah. them for different reasons. I think I'd like to have a cat because they're pretty easy, aren't they? You just like, as long as you, I need a cat flat because mm. I'm on a third floor flat, so I can't really just like... Have it. I don't. I feel like whenever you hear about indoor cats, and then as soon as you let them outside, they're like the outside world. What's this? So, um, yeah. so I feel like my, I feel like I'd want it to be able to see the outside world. Um, yeah, like I, I feel like I'd like to be more hands on and have a dog, but yeah, yeah, I don't think it would suit my life very well. Um, and yeah, I hear a lot of this stuff about like indoor versus outdoor cats, and you know, my cats are obviously outdoor cats because some of them were like feral that just kind of moved yeah. in. Um, and I always felt right that, you know, you'd enjoy the garden with the cat, the cat, you go on a walk and the cat might follow you or something. It'd be <laughs> like outside being normal, but then the a lot path? of people are talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, a lot of people are talking about that it's wrong to let your cats be outside because, um, it's bad for the like local wildlife and they poo oh. in your garden. There's a lot of cat poo in my garden. And I don't have a cat and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like, this cat never visits me for strokes. He just comes to the garden to poo and leave. Um, so yeah. It, and you know, obviously all the dangers of like roads and, and other things that can happen to them. So yeah, I, I'm very on the fence with the responsible cat ownership. Should they stay outside or should they be allowed nah, out? They look know. after themselves. I had a friend who, um, he, uh, <laughs> I don't know why this is such a totally irrelevant story, but it's quite funny. The uh, I had a friend who I used to, uh, an old friend from when I was about sort of ten, and uh, he used to his neighbours used to complain that he played cricket in his garden. And bear in mind, it was in his garden. It's not like it was affecting them. Um, so he t he took to the habit of whenever their dog went and did a shit in the garden, he would sort of shovel it over the fence. And that became <laughs> his his habit every time they complained about him playing cricket in the garden, which I kind of think, oh fair God. enough, it's your garden, you know. Oh, maybe not, but, you know, yeah, that, I, mean, I wouldn't call that. That's not on the garden. responsible <laughs> end, perhaps. Um, yeah. Yeah, not, yeah, not too responsible neighbour. But then we're musicians, so how responsible a neighbour can you really be? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, kind of you, um, weirdly somehow in your, uh, talking about cats and dogs, you sort of touched on about three or four things that I wrote down, um, in terms of when you were talking about things like your lifestyle and, and how, and how, um, so it's, it turned out relevant in the end. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, all is well. Um, so one thing that I thought was quite, um, quite interesting and I'd be interested to hear about is, uh, I saw how many, and I can I can just see just by following you on Instagram how many gigs you're playing, and obviously I know um, following Fury as well. You know, even just following one of your bands, knowing how many gigs you play, um, a, a lot of it's kind of common sort of common knowledge that building a routine is something that helps keep you sort of mentally happy, mentally like in the right place, and sort of switched on and able to be productive and that. And obviously, gigs probably don't help with building a routine and, and keeping your life sort of in in it i don't want to say in order obviously you can keep it in order but um it's, it can be very disruptive to a day-to-day -day sort of routine and i think sort of my question is how do you do you struggle to keep that sort of routine that day-to-day -day, you know getting up at the same time getting stuff done being productive with your day when you know that you've got a gig in like three days that you've got to go and disappear off to and then one in four days after that you know how do you kind of maintain that actually the structure of doing the gigs 
I find more easier to deal with because, you know, when the gigs come around, you know what time you've got to go, you know where you're going to be, you know exactly what's expected of you at each time of the day. Like there's a routine of you set up, you, then you do the merch, then you do a sound check, then you eat, then you do, and, and I quite like it. I get settled into it and I really enjoy everything about the gig. So um, it's, it's when I come back afterwards, that's when you're like, okay, there's a lot of different things I need to get on with. I don't know where to start. Um, you know, there's like, you know, promoting the next gig, all the social media stuff and uh, my Patreon, my teaching, um, like recording or practice and everything like this. Uh, it's like, okay, wh what do I start? Where do I start with this other time that I've got? Um, so, you know, I, I wish <laughs> I could manage to make my other days as structured as my touring days, but it's quite hard to do that. I, I find. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I'm i one where like if I know I don't know if this is something you're guilty of I certainly am if I know I've got like a big thing happening if I know like I'm in the studio in three days or if I've got a gig um, that I'm traveling for at the weekend if I know I've got something that's going to like disrupt my routine my head just goes oh well I guess you don't need a routine for the next four days you know and I just end up like because my I think in my head I'm like well it's going to be disrupted in four days so I guess I'll just get up really late today <laughs> <You know? laughs> which is probably a really unhealthy mindset and I know it is but um, I don't know if that's if that's just a me thing or not um, but I, find, I, I, I feel like I'd, I'd get the um, I do understand the sort of the the structure it provides um, and it's kind of that's raised quite an interesting thing about um, sort of running a band as a business because you've talked about all these things that you kind of um that you have to do just to stay on top of it um and obviously that's perhaps changed from certainly you know maybe like 30 years ago but i feel like it's constantly developing how much you have to do and know as a um as a musician and um i think my, my question is almost did you did you expect to be doing all this business side of things as you were sort of you know, when you were younger, developing as a musician, was this something that you knew was going to be part of your career or was it taking you a bit by surprise? Oh, no, it's, uh, you know, I guess when you imagine the music industry when you're like growing up and stuff and, you know, I guess in the 90s when I was growing up, it was different. You know, uh, most artists, uh, I suppose, especially ones that you were heard of, had managers, they had agents, they had everything. And, you know, you just watch it in the films and you're like, oh, yeah, it'll be like that. That's what it's going to be like to be in a band. And now um of course you know because i'm in a small band of course more of the responsibility is going to be on the members themselves but also i think the industry is changing a lot so that it's actually kind of easier in some ways for uh smaller artists to have some success you don't need to be on all the magazines in in the in the news and stuff and on, on tv to actually kind of make a kind of career out of it so you know it does mean putting a lot of hours in but uh because social media is can, can really work in your favor and there's no there's not really any gatekeepers there you can as much as you can put in as long as you can got, get something that uh that speaks to an audience then you can do a lot more so yeah i guess i didn't expect to be doing all that i'm doing now but um you know it's great that as long as you can develop those skills in uh i don't know i guess i think the best thing about uh, most useful thing to for being in a band is developing skills that are non-musical unfortunately i mean you'd mm. like to have all the time to just play your instrument but uh being able to like do like kind of graphics and uh edit videos and stuff it's going to save you so much money and um you know help you grow as a band without needing to like just leak money at loads of different people to make it happen um and you know that's that's a good thing about I guess people of our generation, they're, they're quite tech savvy and they just uh, go, how do I do this? You Google it and then you like find some program and then you just get on and do it, which uh, which is pretty good. I think a lot of people wouldn't be able to do it as well as we do. Yeah, I, th I think um, it's a blessing and a curse because like it's yeah. enables, it enables you to do all this stuff, like to, to do the things that you'd normally 30 years ago need a label for um, and you'd need more money to do you know like graphic design you'd have to yeah. pay and you'd hire an actual them. artist and now the yeah. artists are just like hey hang on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everyone thinks they're a bloody artist <laughs> yeah. i um what was what i was saying was actually uh the uh legendary guitarist of fury um your friend jake um describes you as sort of one of the most hard-working busy people um i was chatting to him the other day saying how how busy you are kind of um with 
managing the band and and obviously yourself uh, and all and all this stuff um and i i kind of think how do you how do you kind of balance that with your you know like we were just talking about being creative being um tr- you know maintaining what it is that you find interesting about uh, and enjoyable and w- about playing the bass how how do you kind of balance that like that lifestyle because i know i certainly struggle to to do it um and i, th- I think i'm still finding the answer to that question myself really yeah, no, the same boat. I, I don't really, I don't think I'm doing it too well. <laughs> it's very much like, uh, okay, just get, you got to get the, this thing done. This is urgent. That's urgent. That's very important. And really like a lot of what music should be is not thinking about urgency and, 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 you know, urgency and importance. It's about, you know, exploring ideas and yeah, getting, having time to be creative. It does take time to like be inspired uh to do stuff and and play and you know there's only been a few times in the last um you know a few months or year or so that i've been like i really just want to play my bass and i mean you know those are times i I want to play but i know that the things i've got to play is the stuff i've got to do and it's like work and you know that my playing has i think suffered because i've you know just been really just chasing that work rather than uh trying to improve my skills and stuff like this which is uh i don't know it's quite sad but i'm glad that i can at least work in music so i'm like okay let's just keep this going at some point i'll have some time and you know i'm hoping in the next few months now that you know the new fury album is out um all that stress of getting all the orders out is is kind of a lot lower now and most of the touring and like all those initial rehearsals that take a long time that's all done the recording process is done um hopefully there'll be a little bit of a break now like over the summer before we start writing the next album uh but you know at least like in the process of writing the next album that will be a bit of a i've got i have to put the time aside to like explore things creatively and write stuff um which is good but yeah like the stuff that used to really um uh, make me first excited about playing the bass and when you just like go you hear a riff and you go oh i just want to learn that i just want to like sh- noodle that around um i just don't have time to do that anymore which is like really and uh, really upsetting and <laughs> i have a lot of students as well and um I- i'm always being like oh yeah check this out listen to this and this is stuff that i've discovered over the years and you know kind of try and get them into it and that's great but I, I i'm trying to keep keep ahead of them and i'm like okay now i've showed them all the cool riffs i need to find some cool riffs myself like i need to do some have some time to explore and have speak to some other musicians and see if they can inspire me to do stuff so um yeah basically i'm, I'm struggling <laughs> yeah I, I think well the, the good the thing that I, i've said this to a few people i've spoken to the thing i really i think that people listening will benefit from the most is to hear you say things like that because it's like it's so easy to think that um you know you've got like a good following online and you've got these cool bands that you're playing in it's so easy to think that like oh life must be pretty easy you've got a cool you know you've got some cool bands you you, you you're doing music you you you, you kind of you know it's it's easy just to look at it on the surface and just be like oh well that's you know it's not easy but like that looks fun and yeah obviously it it, it has loads of fun moments and it's yeah, yeah but it's not like there's no graft it's not like the graft just stops as soon as you start to find some success of it you know um yeah. but what what's the last thing that's kind of inspired you creatively like this bit oh. of an on the spot question yeah um I don't know. I guess you know the time. The, the last time I did get to like really get creative on stuff was um, you know the last Fury album and getting to to write the parts for that. But um, I, I don't know. Like in terms of playing, like trying to get uh, playing more. I was listening to it was a Testament song, uh, Souls of Black. It's got that cool bass intro, and it was actually one of my students came to me being like, "Oh yeah, I was learning this and I didn't quite understand like." the time signature and stuff and then i was like listen to it and i was like oh right it's because i think it's like in 12a or something like that and so we we're just talking about it and then i was like oh that's a really cool bass line and then um after he signed off i was like oh I've got, i kind of got like a couple of hours free i might like learn this song and like once i got stuck into it i was like okay now i have to transcribe it in full i've got to do this i want to play it and um i got so uh excited about playing a song that uh i, I kind of vaguely knew but i i just kind of didn't realize how cool the riffs were in that song and uh yeah it really got me wanting to play again for a while now it's kind of something i just like to noodle when when i get the bass out 
Yeah, that's wicked. I mean, like, because something that I'm not so well versed in, I'm very much a guitar player that can pick up a bass, you know, like I'm not a bass player. Um, I can pick up, I can kind of do a bit of the finger style, a little bit of slap, but not brilliantly. Um, but what I'm interested in is like, I know how to say write a song on a, on a guitar. I could do that pretty quickly, not necessarily to the highest level quickly, but, you know, I could put a song together on a, on a guitar with some chords or some riffs or whatever in like not too long because you're just familiar with the instrument what's the kind of how do you look at writing stuff on the bass do you do you tend to write some of the original ideas that form a song or do you tend to bounce more off of say like a guitar riff or you know a chord progression or something how does it or, or is it just a case of like some song works some songs start like this some start like this is there like a, a process or is it just a case of you know each song being a bit different um, for me, it's, uh, yeah, very much bouncing off people. Like, I find it quite hard to write with a bass. I know some people do, like uh, Lauren from Hands Off Gretel. She often writes uh, writes a bass line first and comes up with the song around that bass line. Um, but, yeah, for, for me, like, I guess maybe because I've not explored other instruments very much. Um, I, I'm just a bass player. I don't really know. I know, you know, I could bash out a few chords on guitar, but I don't really know, like, the ins and outs of how to construct a good guitar part um and and you know also like a top line i wouldn't really know exactly what to do other than just like i don't know make some stuff up and hope that it sticks so yeah in terms of writing it's it's not really my thing in in fury we tend to uh julian tends to write most of the music and then uh he'll write like the guitar and and uh top line and then we'll kind of then just write around that like write our own parts so yeah in terms of songwriting it's not really my my bag uh i tend to just write my own bass signs where i can and yeah that's about the extent of it yeah that's that's cool i think um what i think is quite cool whenever i've been messing around with kind of again as as a sort of a guitar player on the bass um i, I always find that the more the more restricted i am in some way i find it easier then to write a part that i really like um because if it's if it's a more not necessarily complex riff but like if there's something happening that's quite specific it allows you to latch on to certain ideas and i always find that much more engaging because you might then only have say three things that work rather than like every note under the sun kind of thing <laughs> yeah. so it's uh, i always find like um you know that's what i think is why if i'm writing a chord progression i always try and put little riffy ideas in there or little like slides around and, and, and note f funny note choices in because i think then when you come to writing say like vocal melodies or something it boxes you in in a little in some way but in a mm -hmm. good way because otherwise if i just wrote like gcd there's like a load of notes that work over that and i almost just look at it a bit like it to me i might as well just be looking at like the fretboard just blankly like well i guess all of these work you know um yeah, yeah. like we were in the studio a while back and we were rehashing a sort of a chorus um, and we ended up kind of, and the producer was showing us all these chords that worked um, in the key, essentially just running us through the chords in the key. And like, we're, we're all familiar with, with that. And then it was kind of like a moment of like, okay, we need to fix this because all of these chords kind of do the same thing for the part, which was kind yeah. of like, so in my head I was like, okay, we maybe need to make this more interesting because like, if you can play like any chord in the key and it still kind of sounds like the same chorus, not the same, but like same ish, that means there must be something we've got to change to make it more interesting so that not everything would work with it. If that makes sense. Right, I don't know yeah, if I'm just ranting on now. Um, yeah. I think I know yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Like, cause if they were just, they were just kind of quite, there's nothing wrong with the chords, but they were, so we ended up putting some funky, like uh, extra guitar kind of, jumpy bits in there and riffs and stuff um but yeah it's 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 difficult being being unique in that way i find it so so i'm just kind of ranting now i don't, even, <laughs> I don't have there's no question at the well, end of this i'm I, just I think, uh, you know there's a for me it's very um for a lot of musicians quite self-critical and um ha having fewer options i guess in a way it's like well this will work because it i know it works whereas where if there's so many things that work you're like oh god which one do i put forward to the band like which one will they like what what one's the best one that's going to be uh you know forever recorded uh in in history what uh yeah. like you can never change it once it's recorded so um yeah like it, just having a few options removed from you 
makes it easier to be like okay i know this is probably on the right track <laughs> when yeah. i record i like to uh, when i'm doing like the demo stuff i like to just especially with hands-off gressel because um uh i don't know there, there seems to be more options to mess around with do different things um especially because i was kind of like quite new to the band when i first started demoing with them i would do like two different versions or three different versions like if there was like three verses i'd be like okay i did the first one very basic then i did a bit more then i did even more because with like punk and grunge music a lot of it does lend itself to being simple but then i don't want to be like here is your four notes like you know just like doing the pedaling the root there you go and think that that's the bass line so then i'll do like okay a bit more developed and then even more developed like as much as i could possibly throw at it and i'd be like which one do you like the most and they were like Oh, I love it. Yeah, you're progressing all the way through. This is great. And I'm like, oh, so all three. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. Like, <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I thought it was going to be, the, you know, you repeat the same thing. But yeah, okay, no, we'll, we'll just do all three. Yeah. All of the above is fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, I'll just do the most work possible. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's no copy and paste jobs here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's grunge, isn't it? You can't be copying and pasting. The, no. <laughs> um, our, our producer pointed out something that will forever disappoint me, but luckily I can't find I can't seem to find it anymore. Where um, there's a song I really like, I use as like a reference track, um, and then he was like, he noticed a little like a little click in the in the audio somewhere, just like a little where obviously it'd been something had been recorded there was just a tiny mistake in recording somewhere and you can just hear this little sort of like pop somewhere or like a, a little jump between the guitar parts and then oh, he pointed okay. it out that it's in a chorus and then you listen to every chorus and it's in the same one so it's like oh they just copy and pasted the same chorus which like oh. to be fair i don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with but it's annoying because it's like a song i really like and i just keep hearing this like this little click yeah, in there if, yeah if you can hear a mistake in it and you've copy and pasted that that's a bit like uh... <laughs> yeah it's only tiny it's such a tiny it tiny error it again. <laughs> yeah i think it's a recording mistake where they've comped yeah. apart and it's just jumped across a little bit whatever it is i was like no you've ruined a song for me oh, even though no. well to be fair i can't now find the part which is which i'm thankful for because i would have all oh, um, right what's what what's your take as as we're here what's your take on um if you record a good chorus and then you get the same chorus again exactly the same chorus What's your take on, do you think, are you like a purist? Do you have to record it again, even though it's exactly the same or is copy and paste okay? Um, I don't think it's not okay. It wouldn't be my first choice. I think my mm. first choice would be like, well, if it's easy enough to do it well once, like you can do it again. Yeah. Um, so I think I would, you know, sometimes I like to just like, you know, go through the whole thing and, you know, go through a few things different times. But if I've done like the, you know, the next chorus, I've done it a few times, and I'm like, well, still not as good as the last one. Then just copy and paste it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would. I wouldn't be ashamed of that because mm. I don't know. It's like you can do things as many times as you like, but sometimes you you've just nailed it on that on that one time. Something about that take that works better. I mean, you'd like to think that if you could do it once, you could do it again. But um, I don't know. Yeah. I think I feel like you know it's more common in uh, in vocals sometimes, just because um, even though you know they they will do over and over again once if you've got that like just something spicy about that one take mm. you you might want to use it over and over especially if you're layering backing vocals and stuff it just kind of makes sense to to do that kind of thing um but yeah i feel like on bass it's it's i don't feel like it's as necessary to use the copy, copy and paste thing unless if you're just really low on time and usually um i'm recording at home so uh for furia i record um yeah, here most of the time. So um, I, yeah, I have time to record a chorus again. <laughs> yeah, I um, I weirdly I hate to bundle you in with me on the bass and guitar side, but in my head the the ones that I think you can most get away with copying and pasting would be guitar and bass. It depends on the style of music, but for like your rock and your heavy metal kind of music, and mm -hmm. I feel like drums there might be like a slightly different snare hit and a cymbal somewhere else that wasn't in the last chorus vocals there might just be a slight change in the mel not melody but like the way that the singer mm -hmm. sings that little line somehow whereas i'm just going to play the same thing um mm -hmm. and i think unless i've put in a distinctly different chord or like change between the chords and same with bass i, I could just be like you could you could copy and paste me for a lot of our choruses and you wouldn't have known that, that <laughs> like that it was any different so yeah I'm starting I mean, to think maybe that should be that would be the smart move, but I don't know. 
Yeah. For me, I don't know if me. I trust my uh, editing skills as much as my it's playing skills. You know, I'm like, I could copy and paste, but like, what if something went wrong? Like, what? <laughs> um, I, I've I've got to a really frustrating point in my sort of editing and production where like, I'm I'm good. I'm kind of good enough that it's slightly better than like just out of the box. But like I'm not, I'm nowhere near good enough that it sounds professional. It's a really frustrating point where it's like it sounds okay, but so, so I'm putting the time. I have to put the time in, but then it doesn't sound like pro. It just sounds better than it's just it's Don't not shit. Else <laughs> like, kind of tidy up afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe I should work on that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think um, going back to something, another thing that I, I sort of another topic that I thought would be sort of interesting was um, I really should stop pointing out topics I think that will be interesting kind of s sets you up for failure doesn't it because then if it's not interesting it's, it's like oh sorry and then, and then if it is it's like oh great we're doing my job anyway um, but um, regarding the sort of touring again going back to sort of playing live so much and being such a big part of your life um, obviously the last few years that's been slightly disrupted to say the least um, and uh, I think that rather than asking the generic kind of has that been difficult how's that been for you mm -hmm. um i think almost a more positive spin to put on it is how have you found that you sort of made have you maybe sort of developed as a person in ways that maybe you didn't expect you know if you sort of um are there things you learn along the way or like are there um you know uh there are lots of things like um i, I was looking because i was sort of scrolling through your instagram and finding sort of things i wanted to sort of ask you about and um i saw you made you made a post about all the things you'd done or sort of had time for in lockdown that obviously you wouldn't normally have time to do um so i guess i'm not just sort of asking what are the positives of lock of being in lockdown and covid and all that but like how have you found that that's kind of changed you and what what have you sort of taken away from it um i mean I, i'd like to say first that like there isn't a day that goes by that i don't think about what would life be like right now if that all hadn't happened because you know there were so many plans for my bands and then for myself that like just went out the window um but yeah there were there were some ways that it really I, I think uh there was a big thing that i did i moved house i moved from bristol to birmingham which um may not have happened because you know i i was i was lined up to be extremely busy in 2020 with gigs and maybe i wouldn't have had time to arrange to to try and make the move but then you know when the lockdown first happened i was like oh my god i've got no income now like i thought i was going to be able to afford to move but now i probably won't um but you know through the desperation of like this sudden lockdown even though we thought it was only going to be a like, few weeks or months long um mm -hmm like i was like right i've always been thinking about doing patreon um now is the best time to do it now is the only time to do it because there's nothing else i can do i can't gig anymore um the school that i worked at like a uh, music school had to close and i was like Th there's nothing i can earn so i've got to do this now and it went really well like with the launch of that um and of course uh, so fury were releasing uh, the grand prize album in 2020 it was like the 5th of April or something was the release day. So it was like two weeks into the lockdown. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people were like postponing their releases and stuff. And I'm so glad we didn't because like we could have been like, okay, let's move it four months. Let's move it another four months. <laughs> you know, you could have been like endlessly moving it. Um, but yeah, so I'm glad we, we kept that time of release. Um, just did all we could online and it changed things a lot for Fury uh, because the band has never been that tech savvy. Like, cause I joined in 2019 and you know, I was doing a lot of stuff online and, but I was never really for a while. There was a bit of transition time when we were like, okay, the, the, the whole of fury has lost like three of their members and we got some new members in and it was like, okay, who's now managing who's, who's in charge of social media, who's in charge of this and that. And it was all a bit like, I don't know. Um, but you know, we kind of naturally were like, well, we have to do the internet thing now because we have no other choice. So the um, internet thing, you <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm kind of an expert in internet things. Cause you know, I've got this Instagram is doing well, mm. this Facebook, I kind of know a few things. Let's, let's try and do this. And we brainstormed a load of ideas about what to do. And, uh, it worked so well because we'd never engaged an online audience before. And now 
uh, we can get fans from all over the world and there's people that wouldn't be able to come to our gigs because we only really toured in the UK that are now discovering us and or maybe they already knew us but they hadn't engaged very much because they only heard like a couple of songs and now they're like oh yeah no we're big fans now because you know they've seen us do like live streams um even just like going live on facebook and stuff it was just never something we'd uh, explored before but um yeah so so all of that stuff made a big difference for fury when we came back in um in, like uh summer of 2021 we noticed a big difference in like the kind of uh the audiences we had and and you know just that that like continuous growth online during that time so yeah there was um yeah I, I kind of some benefits um and i i don't know yeah and i still run the patreon it's now like i don't know it, these are things that i'm kind of on ongoingly kind of struggling with like not in a bad way because I, I love doing the patreon thing but it i set it up as a replacement to the gigs and the teaching and everything else I couldn't do. And now uh, the gigs and the teaching are back and I'm still like, well, I don't want to stop doing Patreon because like these people seem to want to stay. And um, I like being able to have that kind of a little bit of stability. Uh, so I want to keep that going, but it's just trying to find the time to balance it all. Um, so yeah, the, the, I guess there's a lot of things that as a band we learned and um that i got out of it but it, yeah i it, the, the main thing i suppose is um uh it, it changed the path for hands off gretel quite a lot because uh we were doing our 2020 we also released an ep uh in march 2020 so both bands were meant to be like touring at the same time hands off gretel and fury and it was going to be a bit of a disaster i suppose you know but you know one band tours that weekend the other the other weekend it's going to be super busy year um and then, uh, but after 2020, after that tour, we were going to take a little break and then come back to gigs in 2022. And now 2022 is here and we're only just having the break now. So mm. it's all delayed everything for um, the Hands of Gretel album three. So it's, I, I don't know, but then it's made the Fury album, Born to Sin, that was like written straight away because F Julian was like, okay, I, I haven't got work. What am I going to do? I'm going to write the next album, even though I've just released the last one. <laughs> like, <laughs> here's another album coming for you. It's the uh, the mindset you need, I think, isn't it, to stay to stay uh, to stay busy? And I think it's um, yeah, it's, like, what it, can I do? Yeah, I think it's it's funny because like some people went into the pandemic and came out with an album. Other people, like myself included, came out with like a couple songs. Like, <laughs> you know, um, I think it it's it's funny how people some people sort of managed to get hold like i i um uh you know do you know the band believe from within um yeah yeah so i think they as far as i'm aware they ended up sort of writing this new album over lockdown um and then then there's me thinking like oh i didn't write an album um <laughs> which yeah. is uh it, it depends how you write i mean if you hmm. say like you prefer i don't know if you prefer like bouncing off people but um julian writes he just writes a song like on his own he just you know having that time to be alone like that really worked for him mm. but if you prefer to get in up you know it being in person to write yeah it was just not allowed or when yeah. people did start coming out to rehearse because we're allowed to because like yeah it's you know this is our job is we're musicians people still frowning upon you and being like i can't believe uh you're rehearsing like don't you know mm. there's a virus? And you're like, well, yeah, but a lot of people are still working and this is kind of my job and I've, I've got to do mm. something. Um, so yeah, like it, it depends how you write. Some it's, For some people, it, like, it was really helpful just to have the time alone. Some people need to have other musicians around them to make that writing process happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, so a couple, a couple of things I was interested um, in. So you've obviously, you've got two quite different bands. Um, both sort of come under rock as an, a whole sort of umbrella, you know, but that's like, that's a lot of music, you know. Um, do you have a different kind of, do you have a different mindset when you write for these two bands or is it kind of, uh, obviously you have to serve the song kind of differently, but um, do you, do you feel like there's kind of Fury Becky and Hands Off Gretel Becky or is it very much the same kind of you, but just adapted? How, how does that kind of work? 
I, oh, it's hard to say. Um, I think I ask questions I don't know what I would answer. With, <laughs> with. I always end up doing this. I, I don't know the answer. If I if I were you, I wouldn't know the answer. <laughs> you know, th there's definitely things that I know um, that you know from listening to like the previous Hands Off Gretel catalog that I'm like, okay, I know they like these kinds of sounds, these kind of scales, and you know these kind of like weird uh, things. You you know you throw in the more kind of um, I don't know, you know, there's a few like little eerie sounds that mostly Sean, the guitarist, like that's kind of his realm. But, you know, you can kind of give, give some little hints of that, some like kind of uh, interesting tones there. Um, whereas, you know, Fury is very, I mean, that, that comes very naturally to me because I've always listened to heavy metal and I always study metal bass players. So it's just kind of what instantly comes to me is usually what, I go for but um yeah so th there is definitely a different approach and i just kind of think of like the previous albums and listen to what's going on but the thing is you know both bands have been developing and changing their sound a little bit so um it's yeah yeah so it is mostly about serving the song because you know the, the, some of the stuff that's on the fury the latest fury album is like nothing like the stuff that's on the the older albums there there's, there's a lot of like you know very upbeat like swing kind of uh rhythms and um there's like walking bass lines or, and, and stuff like this that you know you wouldn't really hear that sort of thing very much in in the earlier albums so yeah like it, it's more i guess serving the song but there's things that i know i feel like i know like lauren will probably like that kind of thing or julian i think will like that kind of thing or tom will like that thing if i do it, it, you know if, if my bass thing follows his drum fill Hopefully we'll get a little nod out of that when we play it I together. always love the musician, the musician's nod or the gun yeah, face. Like, oh yeah, yeah. One of the two when you look over and go, and then they look back at you and you get like the eyes or you get a nod or like a one of them. That's always, yeah, that's always a, a, a positive thing. I am. Um, what, what I found interesting with your, uh, with Fury is that you're kind of doing the sort of classic rock kind of sound and sort of, um, uh, what would you call it? Kind of, I don't want to say theme, but like, it's a very classic rock kind of feel, or like sort of uh, a class, sort of classic metal, really. Almost is more the kind of the, I don't, not genre. I'll think of the right word in a second. Um, but obviously, when you look at some sort of modern, more like modern metal, if you want to call it that, there's sort of going into. I feel like personally, I feel like where I get a bit lost with some of the more modern sounding stuff is there's always an effort to sound different in some way but sometimes that will be through like weird sounds or trying to incorporate other genres sometimes that's great other times it does kind of fall flat on its face um mm -hmm. you know you hear some there that i mean I, I, i'm not going to sort of name any bands but there are somewhere i feel like they've tried a bit too hard to break the mold and then actually it's not quite worked how maybe they thought it would. Um, and I guess it's um, my sort of question is how, how do you, do you think about con consciously about the fact that you're delivering a more like classic kind of genre, if you like, how do you kind of keep up with the times, I guess, and keep it exciting and keep it new and fresh? Cause you guys have a, like a very traditional band set up. Um, and it's not like you hear these sort of wacky synth sounds or like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, take, for example, like Sleep Token. I mean, this is a band that I think do it well, but it's got that kind of those poppy kind of vocals in it. And then the synths are very kind of, you, you think that could be in a pop song. Um, so they've yeah. done that, but there are other bands who have maybe not done it as well. How do you take a more like traditional band sound, but keep it fresh now? Um... I I feel like we're not really trying to because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it's like if everyone's trying to be like okay we need to make it fresh and new we need to add these kinds of instruments because this is what's modern now it's like well okay you're gonna all sound the same and even though you know we've got this tr more traditional sound where okay maybe we just sound like all the old bands and it's already been done we I don't know we, we're still just kind of like we don't really know who to play with you know in in the uh in the kind of UK music scene we're like trying to find bands and, and you know they are out there like in lots of different towns but you know sometimes we quite, quite find uh quite struggle to find the right bands to play with in in some towns because they're not everywhere and you know they're not quite suited but I mean it's fine like we like playing with bands that are different styles and things so um yeah I think just 
in the way that we're just trying to keep it keep it real keep it genuine we're not trying to like shoehorn any kind of things into the into the music just to make it a bit different um we just i don't know i just feel like maybe we are doing something a bit different like um having uh naya recently join um on backing vocals but you know she recorded the backing vocals on uh the, a lot of them on the last two albums it's kind of made it a bit different in, in some way just to have uh two vocalists and uh the, the lead vocalist being uh, male, uh, I, I guess it kind of makes a, a bit of a difference. And, you know, we're really focusing on the show and being very fun. And, uh, you know, we are a serious band, but we, it doesn't need to be boring. Like right? we, we want it to be fun and, and exciting when, when we play. So I don't know. I don't think there is a conscious effort to, to like just do something different for the sake of doing something different. Um, we just uh yeah just do some stuff and and hope people like it in fact like actually this album the born to sin album we it was a bit of a reaction like to to be more traditional because the last album we tried out a few things that were a bit different and people were like that's not metal and we're like you want metal okay like let's go like we'll just rewrite a motorhead song and we'll put, put it on the album and you know hopefully you'll like it and it, you know it's kind of worked um so yeah, we're, I don't know, we're motivated by, by spites quite a lot. If people make a comment about what's metal and what's not, mm -hmm. or, or like, oh, this is, this is gay music. And we're like, you want gay music? We're going to write a homosexual ballad on the next <laughs> album. <laughs> there you go. Next album sorted. Yeah, yeah the, exactly. Um... That, that was exactly what Shadows and Dust is, 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 was motivated by. We, we, um, the, we released Upon the Lonesome Tide, um, a, a ballad about, um, uh, you know, a man at sea, a pirate at sea, uh, missing his woman back home and stuff like this. And people are like, this is gay. And I'm like, well, it, it really isn't that gay at all. It's quite straight, really. By definition, if, it's kind of not. Yeah, yeah, like, it really isn't. But OK, if, you, if that's what you want, <laughs> we will literally write a gay ballad for the, the next, next gay album. pirate ballad. You heard it here yeah. first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we get all Johnny Depp's in the news. Get on the Pirates of the Caribbean or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, the um so you have quite a collection from what i can tell of sort of band shirts i feel like that's something you've kind of it seems to be something that i've seen there's always a new band shirt whenever you're playing from what i can tell anyway um what's what's your best one? Oh, oh, i don't know um oh i love them all you know like i like this one uh this slayer um, wicked the, oh the yeah, that's the classic um one. season is it season no this is the the south of heaven Oh, wicked! Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, I really like that. I, I, most of them I just get um, secondhand from eBay and stuff, and uh, or people doing a clear out. Uh, I think this is from my friend, uh, my friend in Cardiff, Julian, and uh, and yeah, he was just clearing out some stuff, and I was like, I want that one, and I'll have that one. <laughs> and yeah, I, I just, to be honest, I haven't bought many in a while. I just, I, you know, I like to, I like to wear what. I feel like represents me, you know, I feel very strange if I wear something plain um, and I want people to be able to see me and be like, yeah, OK, that's what she's into, which I don't know. A lot of people say, like, you know, do you want people to sum you up that way? But um, I quite like it. I, I, I'd like it if people came up to me and went like, yes, Slayer. <laughs> there's a Slayer. There's always. Yeah, there's always. Yeah. the um, <laughs> Yeah, I think there's something cool about band shirts because it's like it. It's a really cool way of like. I guess sharing that identity with other people. I always know when I'm walking because I, I I have a lot of band shirts, but I don't always I don't always wear them. I guess I um I sort of umming and ahhing about wearing them to gigs because I some I think it's I I really like wearing them on stage because I think like it's a cool way of sharing mm -hmm. something because someone else goes oh, I like that band too and you feel like you've got something in common. But also yeah. it's a way of promoting the band like you know even if they're bigger bands even if like. I mean, I've got well, for example, I've got a sleep token shirt, right? And I quite I like wearing that live. Not, it's not like they're struggling, you know. But yeah, it's yeah. nice to share that like identity. And I like I was uh, I was I was climbing the other day, and I saw a guy in a Meshuggah shirt, and I was just like, cool shirt. <laughs> and he was like, because oh. <laughs> I don't think you expect to bump into another Meshuggah fan no. at the climbing center, you know. Um, so it's cool. I think there's a cool sense of community that maybe you, perhaps you don't see. Maybe it's because I'm not in involved with other genres, but like I don't know, funk. You see, I don't yeah. know if you see 
I think it's a cool way of sharing that identity. Um, yeah, there probably are some other identifiers or something, but yeah, like yeah. the metal band shirt is just the, the way. I'd, and, and I love it since moving to Birmingham because before I lived in Bristol, um, like there's so many metalheads around here. Like it blows my mind. Every time I just go to like a local shop or I'm just out doing a normal day to day things, I'm like, oh, look, it's a metalhead. <laughs> and uh, it used to be so shocking. In the in wild. Bristol, they, yeah, they weren't, they weren't around. Um, you, you'd see them occasionally and you'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa that person has long hair, I bet they're a metalhead, and they turn around and you're like, oh my God, yes, a mega death shirt. Um, but yeah, in, in Birmingham, they seem to be everywhere and it's, it's very exciting. Um, yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I do, I do like the scene here. I think like Birmingham, for all, for all its flaws, does have, um, one of which being roadworks, they're really starting to piss me off around oh here. Oh my God, <laughs> but, so bad. Yeah, but um, one of the things that I do like about Birmingham is the music scene and the... the there's been a lot of trouble, obviously, for small venues, particularly with COVID, but like even without that, like mm. having a hard time. But I do feel like there, there's a, a wealth of places to go, not even just yeah. like metal venues, but I mean, there's probably at least like four places you could go to that consistently have metal on and like yeah. probably about 10 that you could still have a metal night at, if, if not more. Um, so um, I think like that whole small venue... I, I see hope for small venues. Maybe um, if you see places like Digbeth, you know, in Birmingham, for anyone that's not in Birmingham, it's like, mm. this is a bit useless, but um, <laughs> like Digbeth seems oh. to be quite an up and coming place and there are venues coming up all the time. So maybe there's, you know, I know a lot of venues are struggling, but um, it's nice to see a bit of positivity there, I think. Um, have, yeah. have you seen kind of, obviously there's a lot, there has been a lot of talk, you know, there was that fund to protect venues. I think that COVID relief kind of, fun mm. um obviously you've you've played i would guess most of these by now across the country um have you seen lots of them changing and sort of disappearing new ones popping up have you noticed many changes over the last well, i'd say over the last few years obviously not been able to go to them much over the last few years yeah but... i've seen you know a lot of venues have try tried to seize the opportunity of being closed and try and upgrade and, and make things better but you know the, the funding isn't there really uh mm. the most notable one being uh the waterloo in blackpool it's a great venue um they've like just made their place like look amazing uh but yeah there have been some that you know have disappeared along the way and it's it's very sad and you know or they're struggling or they're you know we've had it before where we've booked a venue before the lockdown uh for a show that would have been during lockdown and we try and move it and move it and then they were like how many tickets do you think you're actually going to sell for this because we're really struggling if you can't sell the venue out we don't want you and we're like Whew damn like yeah it, it, that's like uh, we're like i don't know if we can sell it out like i'm sorry like yeah okay we'll go somewhere else fine like if you're going to be that funny about it but how can you get a band in every single night that's going to sell mm. it out like it, it's just not really sustainable but yeah it's, it's a bit desperate but i feel like uh yeah in general birmingham has a really good um music scene in terms of like looking after bands like when when i lived in bristol and we were trying to get gigs in other cities you know london's always a struggle manchester was always a massive struggle but birmingham we seem to play birmingham all the time and i mean i guess because it's not actually that far but in terms of you know it, it wasn't because we were close to it it was just that it was easier to get gigs in birmingham because there were so many going on and they were very welcoming to to new artists coming through whereas Manchester there were very much like if you're not from Manchester if you can't sell 20 tickets you're not having a gig <laughs> we're like oh, mm. I don't know sorry like we can't do that we don't know anyone <laughs> yeah we we kept trying to so like one thing that um one thing that I wish I had like a uh I'm, I'm sure you might have a list of this actually is um the venues that um will that put on the free nights I feel like this is the best way is that uh, from my experience mm -hmm as a smaller band to try and get into other cities is to find places like so grand central in manchester um we played a thursday night there and it was actually it was pretty rammed um mm. it's free entry um because they just get a budget you know the promoter gets a budget to put bands on and we only got paid petrol basically because it was a free night but um if you could find all of those venues across the country you could have a pretty consistent like circuit um just from those free entry gigs but it's so so hard to find the right like subside and birmingham is another one that you could you know they do free entry gigs and you could probably try and get involved with but um but i feel like that's yeah. the way as a small as a small band perhaps to try and break yeah, beyond 
you know? yeah so to make your first like stamp in a, in a new city to be like yeah just come you don't have to pay anything just, and you know hopefully you'll play to other people and you know start making that first impact like those those free entry shows are really important um but yeah yeah then you get to a certain level and you're like okay now we actually need to get paid <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah the um it's kind of i feel like that uh I think um, a lot of obviously a lot of bands. I feel like I know I know plenty of bands that are they t take it takes them a long time to get out of their hometown. Mm -hmm. And I think actually maybe with the right mindset, you can get out pretty quickly if you find the right if you've got the right sort of drive to find you, you know to or maybe just the right mindset to find these places that actually you can. Um, you know, can break out of your hometown. But um, have you got any? Uh, I've got so one more, one more sort of useful question for for the 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 old audience at home. Um, do you have any tips for people starting out bands? If you can think of something that maybe maybe a mistake you made start, you know, sort of developing the band, or things that things to avoid, things to do, any useful hints and tricks? Um, I think. Well, I don't know. Uh, probably just try and get your merch ready as soon as possible, even if it's just small items. I know it's like a financial investment, but um, you know, if, if people do like you, that people still want to buy stuff. And I don't know, a lot of advice people have at the moment is don't, don't, don't bother with albums. Don't bother with CDs. Just release everything digitally. It's too much money to do CDs. But I, I think um, even though, you know, for in terms of like growth online and stuff, yeah, like online stuff, great. But, uh, there are still people out there wanting to buy CDs and you can actually get money back for it. Whereas just, just trying to like uh, sell, sell stuff online, like MP3 downloads uh, and stuff like that, you're not going to make much money from it. Whereas, you know, if you can get a CD together for an EP, like people will buy it. Uh, if you can do like, I don't know, just some little badges to start off and, and work your way up to T-shirts. I think that is uh, very important just to get a band moving. Because I think a lot of bands think, okay, we're going to start, we're going to make a big impression on the industry by releasing these singles, and then someone will pick us up, uh, like some record label, and then they'll handle all this stuff for us. But um, you could be waiting around for a while before that happens. So I would say just like make a start yourself, start like, uh, you know, getting that audience to engage with you more because, you know, some people might listen to it and it's very, you know, you listen to something on Spotify and then you forget about it or you download something and you forget about it. But if you have like your badge that you're stuck on your hoodie or you've uh, got a T-shirt and you see that band every morning when you're going through what to wear that day, uh, you, you remember them. You're like, oh, that was a great band. And um, it's got more longevity to it to, to um, keep the fans in that way. And then when you start touring, yeah, like look for those free entry gigs, look at other bands, tour posters, like fans that are, you know, a similar size or just slightly bigger than you, see where they're playing and uh, start making some inquiries. Um, I'd say mostly with the venues, find out who the promoter is um, from the Facebook pages. Uh, you can contact the bands, but a lot of the time the bands aren't in charge of uh, who else is booked for their event. It will just be down to the local promoter or venue. So. Um, yeah, those would be the avenues to look at to try and just start playing new places and make it actually affordable because hopefully your merch sales will give you the petrol money to get home. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's I think it's an under underappreciated aspect of the band life is is merch. Um, I know we kind of we'd always been talk we were always talking about sort of upping our merch game because um, yeah. because it's just uh, it's something that I think we were always kind of surprised like oh you want to you want to wear our band on your shirt that's cool yeah <laughs> uh, and again it's part of that identity isn't it It becomes part of someone's i've you know um uh, i've had a couple of friends who like th they'll wear my band shirt more often than i would probably wear that band shirt i'm like oh cool that's yeah. really like it's it's nice to see that people support in that way so yeah and some people really like it they like i'm more of a i tend to wear bigger bands like i quite like wearing stuff that's quite easily easily recognizable um to be like okay that person loves megadeth yeah cool mm. um uh, but like cool. a lot of people are like like to wear the more obscure like we oh, haven't heard of this band like but look at the t-shirt um mm. they, they like that and so even if they you know you it's a new band and they've just got their first design it's just a logo it's very basic they'll be like I want to buy their first t-shirt because this is their first t-shirt and I like their band. I think they're going to go somewhere and I've got the original design. Um, so 
yeah, like, I don't think you've got, you know, it is a risk, it's a financial risk, but like, what you expect to lose, I don't think you're really going to, I think as long as you put the time in and actually get those gigs in, um, uh, people, you know, it, it will work well, like my, my whole life at the moment is much like the last few months has just been like, piles and piles of boxes of different like designs of t shirts and, and new things like we've done tea towels and uh, trying to sort out vinyls, badges, hats, everything you can think of, we try and do. Um, you guys have an impressive, uh, an impressive merch collection, to say yeah, the yeah, least. It's quite, like... I remember seeing your merch, like your merch table was like, the corner of the room like it was it was yeah, awesome I... like it's, it's it was a proper you know when you go to like the big big gigs and they've got like the merch the dedicated merch stall i feel like you need to like have a like a, you need like a trolley with like a hole you guys have yeah. quite a selection it's really cool it's yeah, it's, it's good to, to um... menu. oh sorry no i was just saying it's good to have a selection like that it's cool it gives people a bit more choice as well so they're more likely to buy yeah. something because they're more likely to find something they want you know so um... yeah we start to think you know a lot of people have got t-shirts and like I have a lot of t-shirts and so we're like well what do people need like well everyone needs a tea towel everyone you know wants you know something a bit different and if it's something that other bands don't have as well because you know you're like okay maybe they'll buy a t-shirt from that band but they want something else from the, the next band so if you've got something else to offer they might be more interested to look at it um but yeah when we get to venues we're normally like okay where's your merch table and they're like oh it's this and like we need a bigger one and mm. they're like okay this and they were like okay and the other bands where are they going to put their merch and they're like well normally you share and i'm like can we get another table for the other <laughs> bands? like we need more space <laughs> just, just we need the back wall as well like can we put tape up here no okay <laughs> damn what we're gonna do <laughs> yeah just sell it out the van you know yeah <laughs> um but yeah that's the wicked well, i think there's some pretty good advice there for for small up and coming bands as well. Um, so it's the, the moment of truth. I'm going to ask you your question okay. for, for the next person. So it can be whatever you like. Um, obviously you got a vibe of the last question, so you can make it as musically relevant or as cats and dogs relevant as yeah. you like. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to go for irrelevant. Um, okay. Yeah. That's it's always, to be fair. It makes my life easier. A nice irrelevant question. As long as you're not asking about peeing in the pool. And then I always had to ask someone if they've ever shat themselves on stage. So, you know, the first time we meet people is an interesting, interesting one. Bit of an icebreaker. Yeah. Um, um I, I just, uh, just ask them what's in their fridge. Just ask. Yeah. What's see, in your fridge. If, yeah. See what interesting things. But what if, there. what if they're one of those like, um, crazy people and there's just like heads or something you know oh, and then, then they'll just have a look on their face like um milk just milk that's it well they, they, they can just make it up i guess you don't you know you if they're mobile they could uh give you a tour of their fridge but uh yeah to prove it. they'll just like come up with some stuff maybe they got something interesting some like nice leftovers from the day before i will judge their fridge well, it's pretty metal. If they've got heads in the fridge, that's pretty metal. Like, yeah. On the scale of zero to metal, that's pretty far up it. So. They got some like messed up taxidermy going on. Yeah. Oh, this is uh, this is one I made earlier. Yeah, it's like, well, that screws the next three questions for the podcast because that's uh, I need to ask about that now. I yeah. just unpack this one. <laughs> yeah. Before we ask any of the other questions, just need a solid like half an hour to breathe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cool. And the other thing is. Um, do my bit for the what i really would like to do is like if i can grow the podcast to the point where whatever band the person says just immediately gets like a thousand followers i just think that'd be the coolest thing you know um uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's kind of what i'd like to try and be able to where if, if i could just like mobilize an audience and just go listen to them and then and they go yeah and all the all the minions go running towards the band that's that's what that's what i envisage but you know we're working towards it um so yeah, yeah if you can think of a band doesn't, they don't have to be a small band, just a band that's work, that deserves some recognition for any reason. Then, uh, then now what's your chance uh, for that? I would say let's go for Primati, the band oh, yeah. that played with us when when we had our gig together in Birmingham. Because yeah, um, yeah. I think you know they've been going for a while and they're really hardworking, great guys. Um, and yeah, they they had us down for their um big gig in reading and it was such a like you know the the venue we played together you and i like it was quite small um <laughs> the one they invited us down to do was like three three or four hundred capacity oh, we wow. like, oh right okay because mm -hmm. we were like oh, let's do just a gig swap you know like uh i think we'd booked them for ours first and then they were like oh do you want to play ours then and i'm like 
yeah, then we'll just, I don't have to pay you. You don't have to pay us. We just, that yeah. this is all just equal. And they yeah. were like, okay, yeah, great. Let's just do it like that. And then they, I guess they came to our venue, just like, what the hell? Like this place is <laughs> tiny. Like, um, I mean, it's a great venue. Like uh, it's still very yeah. nice, but yeah, their, their one um, was, was much bigger. Um, and yeah, it was really well organized gig. It was, it was a cool night, but um, yeah, I just wanted to shout out to them because they're really nice guys. So you're, you're literally now paying them in exposure. I'm paying you one exposure in return for well, there you go. The one exposure you gave my band when we got to play Reading with you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's paying in exposure. So, lesson, forget your advice. Today's takeaway from Becky, signed off, pay people in exposure. Yeah. That's, I, that's... I think yes, they owe me one now. So we gave them one gig exposure. They give us one gig yeah. exposure. Now I give them one shout out online exposure. I need yes. that shout out online now. From it's got it's, it's to fill your fridge up. How else are you going to fill your fridge? Yeah. So there you go. Full of exposure in there. Fridge filled. <laughs> exactly. Anyone that doesn't know what we're on about that isn't like, I suppose you're not going to get many people that don't know what we're on about listening <laughs> to this point, certainly. So, but anyone that doesn't know, be like, what on earth are they? This, yeah. is, this is some sort of inside joke. <laughs> uh, so yeah, wicked. Well, that's, that rounds it off nicely. Um, so I'll, um, yeah, that, that's quote of the day, pay and exposure. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. If you have anything you want to plug to the world or share or just a, a message to the world, whatever you want to say, um, then then go ahead. Um, I'll just say uh, my website is beckybaldwinbass.com. On there you can find all of my gigs, uh, links to my uh, web store where I sell some things. And uh, you can also find like stuff about my band, so uh, Hands Off Gretel and also fury so fury's website is furyofficial.co.uk and we're on tour at the moment so check out those tour dates and our new album and all this stuff that's it cool i've not had a website plug yet weirdly what everyone's what are they just, doing well everyone's just said like, like good i feel like that is the plug isn't it but everyone's just said like oh i'm doing some stuff no one's actually said a website mm -hmm. yet so you i mean i guess if you google it like do people remember website urls i don't know it feels it's very like thing. um sort of telemarketing you know like go to da -da 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 com for 25 percent off now kind of thing um, am i just showing my age <laughs> everything must no you're showing life. your professionalism <laughs> oh um, <thank> you. <laughs> there's loads of stuff I went, I went on your website to find you know to just like sort of find stuff to talk about like, whoa this is really professional oh, it's, it's scary <laughs> um awesome <laughs> <laughs> well thank you very much i've enjoyed chatting it's been awesome yeah, it's been great. I'm glad it's got a lot smoother in this room. So, um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank <laughs> you.